I was a young high schooler when quadraphonic records started to come out, and I even had a few friends that had quadraphonic, you know, very modest quadraphonic systems. But I really didn't pay that much attention. A few years later, when I was buying my own stereo gear, quadraphonics was already fading away quickly. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to acquire a vintage Sansui quadraphonic receiver. It was cosmetically really nice, but it needed some repairs to get it working again. A few days later, I brought it home and I decided that, you know, I want to learn about this technology, its history, and experience quadraphonic sound for myself. So let's just say the topic of this video is going to be my adventures in quadraphonics. Hi, and welcome to the My Own Devices channel. I'm David Cutter, and I like to make videos about home audio and music. And if you like this video, please don't forget to tap the like icon. And if you want to see more like this, please consider subscribing. I would appreciate that very much. Thanks. Since the advent of recorded music and music reproduction, the ultimate goal was to achieve a more lifelike and realistic sound. Until around 1958, sound recordings were monophonic. That means just a single horn or speaker was used to reproduce the music or voice recorded on an LP or tape. Stereo recordings that required two speakers were an instant smash with the public who were quick to adopt this new music format. Stereo makes perfect sense because, like all mammals, we have two ears, and scientists figured out that our brains combine sounds entering our two ears and instantaneously locate where sounds are coming from with incredible accuracy. And with two speaker stereo recordings, an illusion of an invisible musician performing inside your living room can be created very effectively. Sometimes in the, in the 50s and then in the 60s, engineers started thinking, you know, two speakers is fantastic, but Four speakers would be twice as fantastic, right? They believed that dividing the two channels into four channels would greatly improve the realism of the recording and by surrounding the listener with sound coming from all four corners of the room. Recording tape with four tracks had been around for a while, but reel-to-reel -reel tape was primarily for serious audio enthusiasts and not a mass market thing. So they initially introduced it to the public on quadraphonic 8-track tapes. A couple of years later, quadraphonic vinyl records and hi-fi gear were introduced. Simply put, the information for the rear channels is encoded inside the two tracks of the record groove, and the quadraphonic receiver decodes that information and sends it to the speakers. If a consumer wanted to embrace this latest and greatest thing, they are required to come to grips with the need to buy a new hi-fi receiver or decoding box with an amplifier, as well as two additional loudspeakers and perhaps a special photo cartridge for their turntable. That was a significant investment. The public was skeptical, as they believed this new thing was just an expensive hoax and that the greedy music industry was conspiring to manipulate them to buy things they didn't really need. Besides the extra expense, another hurdle was the confusion over the fact that there was no single quadraphonic standard. And this resulted in several competing and incompatible quadraphonic formats. The three main systems developed in the early 1970s were CBS Columbia's SQ system, RCA's CD4, and Sansui's own QS format. And of course, like they do, record companies priced quadraphonic records at a premium over ordinary stereo ones. They made a point to say that these records were backwards compatible and you can play them on regular systems as well. Another big issue was that although there were thousands of titles available, most record stores had not stocked very many of them. By the mid 70s, it was pretty clear that quadraphonic music was not going to catch on with the general public. And by 1978, Critics deemed it to be a complete and utter failure, and record companies and electronic manufacturers gave up on it as well. So what happened? I believe the majority of music listeners were very skeptical from the start and believed this was an unnecessary expense, and they were perfectly happy with their stereo systems as they were. Let's take a look at my Sansui quadraphonic receiver. 
This unit is huge and pretty heavy, considerably wider than a standard width model. Four illuminated meters display the relative power being sent to each of the speakers when in four channel mode. Only two are lit up when listening in stereo. To the left of the volume are three balance controls. Now these independently adjust front to rear and left to right balance. Quadraphonic headphones, which yes, they had them, had a pair of connectors to power the extra speakers inside, which explains why this receiver has two headphone jacks. I'm just setting up a new small listening room in my house and I decided to try out the Sansui with some proper quad listening material. I went to a local used record store and found a copy of Steely Dan's Pretzel Logic in Quadraphonic. Their label ABC was one that supported Sansui's own QS system. The turntable I am using is this old Technics with the popular value-oriented Ortofon 2M Red movie magnet cartridge. I do wish I owned four identical speakers for this demo, but after trying out a few different ones, I decided on a pair of similar vintage floor standing uh, speakers. So we got some Klipsch in the front and some old DCMs in the rear. I set the control to the straight QS quadraphonic setting and it's labeled QS regular matrix. There is also a hall mode, which the manual says is best for listening to live recordings. What did I think of quadraphonic sound? Well, I put on Pretzel Logic and moved my swivel chair to the center of the room. While listening, I really didn't know which way to face as the music was emanating equally from each speaker. There wasn't any front or back, it was all front. As I rotated my chair, I always felt like I was facing the front. Even though I was using non-matching pairs of speakers, I didn't notice a hugely dramatic difference between them. I was just listening to and enjoying Steely Dan's Ricky Don't Lose That Number playing all around me. And I was surrounded by music and it was really nice. The record didn't try to dazzle me with quadraphonic effects and moving from speaker to speaker. It was tasteful and very well done. However, I can't say that I could notice any imaging or an identifiable soundstage, which was a bit disappointing. I probably had the same exact reaction as listeners 50 years ago. That it was okay, it was fine, but you know, I could live without it. You know, the engineers back in the 1970s were no less clever than the engineers of today. They worked within the limits of the current technology and developed numerous ingenious solutions in a pre-digital world. So, was it a revelation? Did it give me new insight into the the music I was listening to? No. Did it make me want to rush out and buy a bunch of more quadraphonic albums? No. Do I have a better understanding as to why quadraphonic ultimately failed? Yes. As pleasant as the experience of listening to Pretzel Logic and full quadraphonic sound was, it did feel a bit like a gimmick in the end didn't really enhance my experience all that much. Doubling the number of speakers did not double my enjoyment of the music. You know, the record companies and the manufacturers probably said, you know, we got people to go from mono to stereo and that was a big hit and we made a ton of money out of that. Maybe we can do the same thing with this quadraphonic thing. But in the end, it didn't work out and it was probably just two speakers too far.